changing the dates of the podcast too much. I need to make a schedule. Otherwise, it's it's Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and you know, man, I, I wish I could be everywhere. And I'm getting a lot of people going, like, hey, you coming up to Ann Arbor, Michigan? And it's like, dude, that's like, you know, it's so <laughs> out of the way. Where are you going to go? Yeah, and I have to get back to California at some point. I can't just be on the road Yeah, yeah, you got you gotta do, You got to make money. Fuck something. yeah. So, uh... Fucking Sucio Talk. I'm here sitting here at Anju with Angel Barreto. What's up, Chef? What's going on, brother? How, How are you, doing, man? Huh? Thanks Good, for man. doing this, yeah? Of course. Fuck yeah. So, um, you're at Anju. How long have you been here? I'm the opening chef. I've been here for two years. Okay, very yeah. cool. Very cool. Yeah, very young restaurant, as, as you were telling me before. And um, real quick, this because uh, we were talking about Aspen, food and wine. How does that happen? How does that whole process start? Um, so Kush, who's the editor of Food and Wine, she okay. basically travels around the country. Heard. Um, recommendations from past winners of Food and Wine, sh- other chefs, and editors of restaurants and places to check out. Um, so she, she goes everywhere. She travels to Ann Arbor, Michigan. She basically tries to go as many restaurants and places as possible. Yeah. I creates, read an article she wrote about that. Yeah, she so, creates like a yeah. short list of places and... I was actually lucky enough that Anju was one of the places that she chose. Heard that. I wasn't even here the night she was here. I knew she was coming in town, and she's like, hey, I'll be coming into D.C. And I was like, okay. She like, lets you know? She's just letting me know she's going to be in D.C. in the area. She was like, because I've talked to her before just to see, hang out with her. You know, and just talk. Because I've always missed her every single time she's come oh, here. Got you. Um, but I didn't know the night she's going to come. But she's just like, you know, I was like, hey, I'll be in D.C. if you want to you know, meet up or talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it never worked out because I was... It was my day off, and I'm very strict about my time off. Fuck yeah. It was my time off. That's what you need to do. Um, so, but this was not her first time. This is, like, the second or third time she's been to the restaurant. Um, so I think at that point, she already kind of made up her decision to kind of put us on the list. And I didn't know for the longest time. Um, I was getting ready to go on vacation to the Dominican Republic. And before I went, she said, hey, can we do a Zoom call? And I said, sure, no problem. I'm going to talk to you about Dolcherak. Dolcherak is, like, a Korean-style lunchbox. And I okay. was like... Okay, cool. sure. Yeah. That's kind of a weird request, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so we go on the Zoom call, and she's like, "Hey, I don't, we're no, I don't want to talk about Doshirak with you." And I was like, "Okay, what do you want to talk about?" And she's like, "I just want to let you know you've been named Food and Wine one of the best new chefs in America." And I was just like, "Holy fucking yeah. shit!" Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know how to react, and I'm like trying to control myself a little bit. I'm like, it's a huge surprise because for me. I never think about anything we do here in the prospect of getting accolades. It's just in the prospect of propelling the food and the message of what we're trying to do here. Yeah. So anytime we get any recognition, I think that's fantastic. That's great. But it's always such a huge surprise. So yeah. I was just immensely shocked. I never in a million years in all my years of a career thought I would be here. Yeah. Or anything that happened in this restaurant has happened. Yeah. And I bet your your mother's Puerto Rican? My dad is Puerto Rican and my mom okay, is gotcha. black. Understood. Yeah. So... And we'll we'll get into that your your upbringing a little bit. But how was it like calling them and telling them that? My parents have been the past like five years of my career super immensely proud of what I've done and accomplished because yeah. they've seen kind of the struggle. You know, what it starts is take up start yeah. in this career, and to get to be a chef. Yeah. You know, when I got here, they were very proud because it you know it's been a ten year journey to get here. Yeah, yeah, yeah just for to be sure. executive chef. Um, so my mom was immensely proud. My mom is probably the biggest cheerleader in my life. Of course, yeah. Uh, my dad's immensely proud. You know, they want to tell all their friends, like, hey, you can't tell anyone, though. You know, <laughs> they end up telling everyone anyway. Like, I went to go see some family friends. They're like, yeah, they're like, hey, your dad told me you, you yeah, won this. Of course like, he did. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Of I told these people not to tell yeah, anyone. Nope. I was like, you can't keep secrets. No, nope, you don't tell your family if you want to keep <laughs> yeah. a secret, bro. So they were, they were very, very proud. Dope, yeah. man. That's yeah. so dope. Um, so let's go back. Let's go all the way back. Where were you born? I was born in upstate New York in a town called Watertown, about okay. two hours from Canada. Oh, shit. Yeah. All right. So, right. Did you did you go to Canada a lot? That's no. Like, so, kid? we were... My dad was... My, both my parents were military. Yeah. So, we were pre-basis. So, I was born in a military base in Watertown, New York. Oh, no shit. Okay. Um, so, I was born there, basically, and I only lived there for, like, maybe the first two years of my life, and then we moved. Because we were military, we moved basically every two, three years, because mm-hmm. of my dad's job. Heard that. Heard yeah. that. Okay. Um... And what did your what did your mother do? My mom originally was also in the military. That's how they met. Both okay. my parents met in Germany. Um, my mom was an engineer in the army, and then my dad was also in the army. Um, they met in Germany, and then once they got married, my mom retired for a, basically she retired. She didn't work anymore. She stayed at home. Yeah. Um, when we moved to Seattle. She w- started working again. Um, 
but once we moved back to South Carolina, she stopped working. And then my dad, once we moved here, he got a permanent job at the White House. So he was at the White House from the Clinton administration all the way up until the Obama administration. So he actually retired on Air Force One. So we got to ride on Air Force One in Chicago. Dope. And the president came out and gave, like, my dad a cake for his retirement stuff. Yeah. So it was, like, a really kind of weird and surreal upbringing. Yeah. Because, like, I would go to the White House for Christmas parties. Forty plus in the White House, <laughs> yeah. baby. I like that. It was, it was crazy. Been, it was awesome. That's cool, man. So, uh, was he security? I'm, I'm guessing. No, my dad did. Uh, it's called White House Transportation. It's okay. called Carpet. So he was uh, one of the people in charge of logistics. So, what does it take for Air Force One, um, Secret Service, and everyone to go to Tanzania? You know, so they would do advanced scouting trips for hotels and all the security stuff. So he was always part of that stuff. So it was really, really cool. So that he had a very so close cool. relationship with the president, with the president's team, with, you know, White House photographers. Yeah. So it was always really cool when I would go to the White House because, like, everyone kind of knew my dad. Yeah. And, you know, and they knew him. So it was really cool. Like, when we went to the White House to see the Bushes, you know, I got to meet Laura and Jenna and their parents. And they knew us. When we went to meet the Obamas, it was the same thing. And the crazy part is, like, every single president that I've met from Clinton, they're not really like the, how they see him on TV. Yeah. They're very personal and very nice. Of course. The I'm most sure. engaging were probably the Obamas. You know, Michelle Obama would come, like, hey, how's college? How's this? How's that? And ask questions. You know, she genuinely really cared. Yeah. So it was really super awesome. Well, that's badass. This is, like, in your phone. It's like, yeah. That's pretty fucking cool, You know, like, cool, I went dude. to a, I, I used to go to, like, carnivals on the White House grounds and yeah. Easter egg rolls. We would have Christmas dinner at the White House and stuff, so it was pretty cool. Yeah, I guess uh, when you're the child of a president, like, you know, speaking about that, they probably don't get to go anywhere they want, you know, all yeah. the time. It's just it's security. That's so cool, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, early in life, like, what were you eating? What was, what a little was bit of like? everything because, I, like I said, I was very lucky because my parents were in the military, so my mom traveled a lot. My mom lived in Korea. My dad lived in Korea. My mom lived in Germany. Um, and I was very fortunate to kind of have a, a diverse upbringing in food because my yeah. mom was super inquisitive when it came to food. My mom cooked Korean food at home, and she would try to make sushi and look at all these recipes and always try to cook food. My mom was taught Puerto Rican food from my grandmother. Yeah. She's like the only one in our family who actually cooks Puerto Rican food. Okay. So like we have pasteles and pastelo yeah. and all that stuff. My well, mom if you're going to marry a Puerto Rican, that's basically the only rules. Exactly, like, You yeah. just got to be able to make rice and beans every day. And that was like huge for my dad because, you know, his family lived in Chicago at the time like we were living in South Carolina and we were always traveling we were so far from family you couldn't get those comfort things uh, so my mom would make that at home and that became like a regular thing in our, our family having Puerto Rican food for you know Christmas and, yeah. and Thanksgiving Benil, having, yeah. gandule, all that shit so that was really cool um, and then the great thing also was my mom um, her family were sharecroppers so my mom grew up on a farm so my mom knew how to do canning um, all that stuff she was taught from her grandmother because my mom grew up in New York also yeah um, so she grew up on a, a huge farm, so she knew all these things, and she kind of introduced them to us. My mom was not a huge baker, but, you know, she tries to bake cheesecakes and yeah, things yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I was very fortunate because I was telling people my mom is a fantastic chef because she, even still to this day, she tries to do different recipes from different ethnicities and always tries new things. She's super inquisitive, and she's one of the main driving factors that I cook. Yeah, awesome, man. Uh, so when you, when you knew that, uh, but before we get there, what were your interests as a child? Kid. Sports, school, things so, like that. So, like when I was in high school, I did lacrosse. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I kind of hopped around. I put, tried to do soccer for a little bit. Was it important uh, for your parents that you did sports and that you no, were involved? No, it wasn't too much. My parents were always the type of people who were like, no matter what you want to do in life, do it. Um, I was huge into history, and I always thought, like, when I got out, because my dad was at the White House, I thought I was going to be a lobbyist. I always thought that was the career I was going to do because I love history. I knew I wanted to do something with it. I was always good at, like, debate and those type of things. Yeah. Um, so I started doing an externship um, and when I got out of high school, and I thought, this is not for me. Working in an actual like lobbying firm was like not, yeah. not the move. It was just like so draining and not creative, um, and I just didn't want to do it. So I talked to one of my friends who I consider like my brother. He, at the time, he was at Johnson & Wales, and I was like, you know, I think I want to go to culinary school. Yeah. And he was like, just fucking do it. He's like, you always love cooking. You go out a lot. You you know you eat you're super inquisitive. Yeah. He's like just do it, and so I just said fuck it, and I did, it, and I went to culinary school. What year was this? Uh, this was 2007. Got you. Yeah. And what campus? So I went to a culinary school in Maryland. It's called Academy de Cuisine. Okay, got you. Yeah. Got you. Okay. So it's now closed, but yeah. it was like probably one of the most important culinary schools in the area. Uh, like Carlo Hall went there. Yeah, Kats- yeah, yeah. Katsuya Fukushima. Like a lot of people Badass. in DC 
went there, and they were a big driving factors for bringing Cooks into DC yeah. too. Yeah, you know, I got to say that the the smaller programs, like mm-hmm. not the universities, they was, they make better chefs. And it was great for me because like, it was like a no frill <laughs> school, and it was it was taught by like the old guard of French chefs who immigrated yeah. to DC. Um, Jean Louis Paladin, you know, was great friends with the owner. You know, we had the former chef at the French embassy there. So it's like, if you're going to learn French food, yeah. these are the guys you want to learn from. You know, yeah. I had a chef named Chef Michel who ran one of the biggest French restaurants in D.C. Uh, and these are like the old guard of chefs. Yeah, yeah. They used to smoke cigarettes and stuff on the line. So, that's <laughs> like, so like, these are the guys like I wanted to learn from. You know, yeah. like, still, this guy's like smoking marble reds in his car still yeah. before you know, class. It's so cool. You know, you and know? it was great because I always got like really two diverse aspects of like cooking from them. You know, he said, I do this way, he does it this way. But at the same time, I had a chef from Thailand named Shanchet, Samchet Chumpapo, uh, who taught us Thai food. So we not only just learned French food, we learned a little bit of everything. Because we did have some American chefs there who taught us pizza and barbecue and those type of things. Yeah. So it was a very well-diverse uh, education. The whole idea there was like, we're going to give you a, found, a solid foundation from there. You need to take the ideas and the skills we build with you to kind of expand. Gotcha. And that was awesome. Holy fuck. Uh, how long is that program? So it was a, it's a two-year program. Yeah, at the time. It was like two years with your externship and everything. So yeah. it was like a more expedited. Because at the time, I was like, I don't want to go to college. I had already started going to college, and that wasn't for me. Uh, like, I had looked at going to ICE and other places, but I was like, this school is more personable, and this is the type of education I wanted. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that really worked for me. Because it was, like, laser focus, and I think it was probably the best thing for me to get out of that. Because, like, I, to, still to this day, I take the techniques and the knowledge that I have and apply them to Anju and, you know, to make Korean dishes a little bit different. Yeah. But still have that same, what's called Hansik traditional core value to them. Were you, um, so you were sort of always uh, in the Asian food scene. Like when, from college, Thai, your mom cooking Korean yeah, food. Yeah, so like, like I always, always knew. It's always been a big influence. For me, I always knew I wanted to cook Korean food. Um, when I went to Wolfgang Puck at the time in D.C., they did kind of pan-Asian food. So yeah, yeah. Scott Drino at the time was the chef. He did Chinese, he did Thai, he did a little bit of everything. He didn't do Korean food. Okay. So I went in for my interview, he's like, what do you want to cook? What kind of food do you want to do? And I was like, I want to cook Korean food. He's like, well... This ain't the place, bro. We don't do Korean food. <laughs> and I was like, okay. But he's like, don't worry. He's like, we'll figure out a way for you. We, you can learn how to do Korean food. You can do Korean food and you can grow. So eventually, like, I got to a point in um, the source. Like, I had a Korean tasting menu downstairs. You know, I ran a kitchen and we were doing whatever I kind of wanted. I was making my own kimchi. We were doing kamje talang at the time. I was doing a lot of dishes that were experimental that actually helped me to build what we have here. Yeah. Which is awesome. So dope. Yeah. Damn. Um, and this this job that you got was right after culinary school? So right after culinary school, I joined um, a restaurant in Virginia called Vermilion. So Vermilion at the time was in Alexandria, Virginia. It was a farm-to-table restaurant, like a true farm-to-table restaurant. Um, we got fish in every day. We made pasta. The cooks were responsible for literally every single thing on their station almost. Yeah. Um, it was small and like a row house. And at the time, it was like the number two restaurant in Virginia. And it was cool. Um, really like small, focus, seasonal food. And it was great because I wanted to kind of – I knew in my mind what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in a small restaurant. I wanted to work in a big restaurant, in a medium-sized restaurant and see – where I kind of fit in, where do I thrive, what makes it, you know, what makes sense to me as a chef, or the chef I want to be as a cook, so I was going to hit up three types of places, uh, so that was the first place, I went to Vermilion, and that was great, and then I went to the source, and the source at the time was insane, you know, you had, Scott had won like every award in DC at the time, when I went in, we had two sushi chefs working every single night, mm-hmm. we had two chefs working walk, we had a full dim sum station, we had... Um, a fish, a huge fish station. Uh, we had a, a huge grill station that did Peking duck and all this like really yeah. crazy stuff. And I loved it because it was so vibrant and there were so many things going on in the restaurant. And I was like, "Well, this is super cool. I've never seen a restaurant kind of like this. It felt like you almost like in like mini Hong Kong, you know? Yeah. Because there's just like so much going on. It was busy. They were doing like 200 covers every single night. There was an upstairs, a downstairs. They had a huge pastry team. Yeah. And I was like. Maybe I want to do this. I want to learn how to work well. Yeah. And I end up staying there for six years. Oh, whoa. Yeah. Got you. So you really got everything out yeah, of Yeah, so I worked my way up. I worked my way up from a cook to sous chef to executive sous chef. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's like two ways you could do it. It's either like one year at a restaurant for many years yeah. or like three restaurants for many years. Yeah, like I know? fell in love with like the ethos and the culture there for a while, you know. 
you get kind of indoctrinated when you go into like big systems like that. I think. Yeah, you do. And so like I got kind of sucked into it. And well, they know how to give you incentives. Yeah, and that you was. Know?